Okay, well, we're on? Yes, my tech tells me I'm on. So, good morning, welcome. I'm Sylvain Bergeron, I'm an educator with Bernina. And today's webinar is Ask the Bernina Educator, right? So, I, we received uh, questions ahead of time by email, so I've collected them into a Word document, and I'll be going through them as much as I can. If you have questions along the way, uh, well, first thing, let's make sure the sound is okay. If, uh, the, if you don't hear me, uh, type in the, the chat box or the question box. Actually, that would be hard to, if, if you can't hear me, you can't hear me, right? Um, are we, uh, I'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on the console here. We're, we're camping in the conference room today because we're filming in three different places at the same time. So I will be answering as many questions as possible. I don't know everything. There's a few products I don't use as much as others. But if I don't have the answer, I will uh, do my best to point you in the right direction to get the information that you need. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, the, I have a couple of questions that are very... So, are you on me now? Are we on? Okay, we're switching camera right now and the switchboard is uh, hiccuping. So, um, if you can if you can see my face, uh, just just type a yes, please, in the questions box or the chat box. Okay, I you know I can see my little vignette, my little GoPro. So all right, so the first question I, I we receive all the time, and several of you asked it is if I have dual feed on my machine, do I need a walking foot? The short answer is yes, but let me tell you why. If you have dual feed, there's a, a chunk of the foot at the back of the D foot that'll be cut out. And then the dual feed will help with traction behind the stitching point. So basically after a stitch is formed, then the traction really takes over from the back there. What means that on it's on a quilt sandwich, that could lead to the toes at the front creating this ripple and this drag on the front of the foot. That's physics, right? Because the foot is trying to, uh, and it's in the case of a quilt sandwich, is trying to smash that down and then feed the whole thing together. So the dual feed helps, but it can only do so much. Let me show you the difference with the walking foot. The walking foot basically does not put as much pressure on the fabric as like the, the moving pads, you know, that do the traction, do not do as much pressure on the fabric as the dual feed did but they have five times the surface area. So your dual feed is equivalent to that little tiny pad at the back here. It does a lot, but if your quilt is more than a few pounds, it will fall short. It's just not able to haul that kind of weight. So these two pads that are on both sides, if you notice the pads start before the stitch point, a little before, they go through at the stitch point and continue behind. So what happens is that the fabric is being grabbed and controlled before it's stitched, pulled to the stitch point, stitched down, then pulled back from there. So it's five times the performance. So I, I did a webinar last year. If you go to the recorded webinars on learn and create on Bernina.com, uh, our website, so Bernina, learn and create, and then look for webinars and recorded webinars. I did one on dual feed versus uh, walking foot for like 45 minutes. So that explains all the nuances of it and you see them in action as well. So dual feed, five times the convenience. It's there, you engage it, it helps a lot. And it's good enough for mug rugs, table runners, and smaller quilting projects. For bigger stuff, heavier, chunkier stuff, you need a walking foot. So I do have, I do have both and I like, the, I like the nuance that it gives me that I can go quick and easy or if I need heavy duty, I have that as well. So that's for dual feed. The other question we got is, if you have a Bernina hook, a five, a current five series and seven series or four series for that matter, um, 
do I need the, uh, for the five and seven series, do I need the gold, the yellow bobbin case for embroidery? And funny enough, I think it comes with the gray hair. You, you, I've been around Bernina. I, I will be turning 25 years with Bernina in January. So I've seen a lot of water under the bridge and I've been on the canoe under the bridge too. I was the official tester for embroidery for the yellow, the gold bobbin case. So I digitized and it, I digitized a maxi hoop full of everything. I threw everything at it. Satin stitches, triple stitches, fills, angles, densities, all sorts of stuff. And the regular bobbin case for regular embroidery designs does really, really well 90 some percent of the time. But once in a while, you'll have a design that will throw the needle. And remember, the needle is what actually stitches with the hook. So the bobbin case is doing its job, but the needle is the primary element. And you may have like fills, and I use a 75 embroidery needle as a starting point all the time. But sometimes let's say you have a fill that may be somewhat dense. And then like on a badge, you may have satin stitch lettering or design elements on top of a fill. And then sometimes it gets a little dense in there and the needle may have, may struggle to let the thread flow through as it's supposed to perfectly. Then in cases like that, you may see that the thread gets too tight because the needle gets too tight into the embroidery. And then when it comes back up, it would yank the bobbin thread up with it. That's just basically too much tension, too much pressure around the needle. And I found that with the gold bobbin case, the yellow bobbin case, that one half a percent of cases where this could happen went away. I did a whole big maxi hoop sample at once. And again, I threw the kitchen sink at this. And when I flipped it over, all my stitches looked even left and right, like on a satin stitch. And when I looked at the top, there was not a single instance of the bobbin thread showing up. So it's an insurance policy. And it also means that you never have to worry about it. Now, there are other applications that you can use it for. If you have an old Bernina, like my 1260, with the old, you know, what we call the CB hook and the metal bobbin case with the little finger, there's a hole in the finger, right? If you have an Artista 200 or 730, you have the gold latch bobbin case with a piggy tail. Those were meant to add extra tension. And if you look at the Bernina 1260, it doesn't do embroidery. They would tell you to use the bobbin gate's finger for satin stitch, like applique, for buttonholes, for decorative stitching, applications where you want to guarantee that the top thread will always wrap under the fabric and never give a chance to the bobbin thread coming up. So I use it for that as well. So for sewing, sewing applications, I use the gold bobbin case on the, uh, what we call the Bernina hook machines. If you don't have embroidery, you can still use that gold bobbin thread, a bobbin case, sorry, on a four series if you want to do buttonholes and applique. It's great, great for applique. Now on an eight series, which does not have the bobbin case, there is a, a bobbin adjustment, uh, a tension adjustment on the bobbin using the multi-purpose tool. So that's equivalent. And I do use that sometimes on my eight series as well. Okay, uh, uh, a completely random question. What makes a jeans needle stronger if it's the same size as a, let's say a universal embroidery needle? A, a needle has many parts to it, right? You have the, the basically the shank. And at the top, you have the, the chunky portion of the shank that attaches you know, it to the machine. It gets squeezed into the needle socket. Then you have the main shank itself. Then you have the eye and the tip of the needle. And the tip of the needle is swollen a little bit. It's the one that opens up the hole in the fabric to let the thread come down, get grabbed by the hook, wrapped around the bobbin case, and then picked up by the take-up lever. The whole time, the groove in the front of the needle will uh, serve as a passage so that that thread can be pulled up and you flow and slide against the needle. So the shank portion can be of various thickness, but the official thickness of the needle is near the bottom where you see the, the, the whole tip and eye and the, little, you know, the, the two parts of the needle around the eye. That's what defines the actual size of the needle. The shank is typically a little skinnier than that. And on a jeans needle, it's actually a little thicker still than compared to a regular needle. And also top stitch needles tend to be, uh, tend to be stronger as well because they're called to do like on high size, like uh, size 100 or 110 or 120, they are called to do like very heavy duty work. And in between, now that I've mentioned those two, if I need to go past a size 90 jeans needle. Typically, I will, if I have to go to 100, like a tote bag with a lot of layers and fusibles in there and a whole bunch of stuff and straps, I will, if I go to need to go from a 90 to a 100, I will switch to a top stitch. 
because they're very similar in strength, both sharp points, but the top stitch needle has almost twice as high an, an eye opening, which means it gives that extra clearance for the thread in very heavy duty applications, especially if I'm using very heavy thread. For instance, if you're doing a upholstery with a really heavy polyester thread, you could, I would, you benefit from a top stitch needle at that point. So I consider jeans a sharp upgrade in strength and top stitch an upgrade from jeans. Okay. All right. Next, somebody has an 820 and uh, sh uh, the, uh, you had the walking foot attached and you tried to use the needle threader. And it, uh, in the vernacular here at the office, we call that smacking the lips. When you thread an eight series, the pre, what they call the presenter that drops down when you thread has you know two parts and then the basically the socket where you snag your thread. Well, we call that the lips because it looks like a pair of lips and they go to the needle and swing back. If you do not select the presser foot on the machine and tell the machine what foot is on, with the walking foot, foot number 55, the leather roller filled, and some other chunky feet, then if the machine does not know what foot is on, the threader will hit those feet because those feet get in the way. They're chunkier and they're not a nice foot in the middle as usual. They, they present like brackets and bars and stuff like that. So uh, if you smack the lips, as we say, you don't want it, your tech will have to look at it. It could be that it's just offset, they can correct it. A colleague of mine, I won't mention names, Debbie, but Debbie had that exact problem. She forgot to tell the machine what foot was on and by the time she pressed the threader button, she smacked the lips and it was a repair. So I, let me give you a, uh, it's not just a word of advice, it's what I do all my seven and eight series, my machines that let me select the presser foot. Your machine always recommends what foot for the stitch you're using, but if you are using a specialty foot and your machine allows you to select the foot, do that. Actually, I always select the foot no matter what I put on the machine. That way it's become an ingrained habit. It's like, I don't have to look, you know, I don't have to look. It's like when you drive your car by now, you know where to grab the, 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 the seat belt in your, you know, because you drive it every day. It's the same kind of thing. I don't have to think about it. I always select the foot if my machine lets me do it. That way I don't break needles. And I don't, I don't, in my eight series, I don't endanger my needle thread. Okay. Um, so uh, somebody recently added the plus upgrade to their 770 QE. It's a wonderful upgrade. It brought a lot of great features. And wondering how to use the item called quilting in the hoop. So the quilting in the hoop, uh, the, the, there are two num the items that are numbered like 12736 01. Those are embroidery designs. And actually, if you ever encounter, especially with Bernina, because we are a sister company to embroideryonline.com, uh, which is OESD, uh, if you see a number like that, you could go to the website at embroideryonline.com and punch that number in, and it will show you what design it is, and it will tell you what that collection 12,736 is. If I'm not mistaken, don't quote me on that one, but I think it's an Amanda Murphy. But either way, uh, that those are embroidery designs that you load in. There's a process to set up your machine for quilting in the hoop. I won't get into all the details today, but let me show you. Um, I need to show my screen. Let me show you on, on Facebook where you can go. Okay, on Facebook, we have um, a series of live webinars. Okay, I'll show my screen. So on Facebook, I just went to facebook.com. I went to uh, Bernina USA. So I went here to Bernina USA. And then when I got there, I just searched. And if, if you want all of these, when you search on the Bernina USA Facebook page, uh, my colleague's name is Connie, uh, Connie with an I-E, uh, Fanders, F-A-N-D-E-R-S. She is uh, basically our education, uh, not education, embroidery specialist. So if you search for Connie, then all her Facebook lives will come up and she's done an entire series of different scenarios that go over uh, computerized quilting, which also is known as quilting in the hoop. And it uses designs like the ones you mentioned. So these are, that's a basically a whole course if you want, where you can watch at your leisure. There's a recorded and you can basically just go over the information and learn all about it there. Okay, we can go back to, my part of face. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
the next question, while we switch cams here, the next question is, um, I would like to know how to program the letters on my 740 with a knot, a securing stitch at the beginning and at the end. <laughs> and Randy, Randy is going to be, you know, like switching cam a lot today because let's go back to my screen. I will show you this on the simulator. So what I did is, uh, and I, uh, by the way, if you do not have the simulator for your five, seven, or eight series machine, or even four series on your computer, you'll want to go to the Bernina.com, go to the product page for your machine and make sure you install the simulator because when you have a question uh you don't need to boot the machine anymore if you're already at your computer you could actually verify stuff are we uh are we just in set vignette or are we full screen with it okay so people are seeing me or my simulator okay so i install this i have all the simulators on my laptop because i have to be able to work with them all so when you do lettering that's going to be combi mode right so on your touchscreen Berninas, if it helps you remember the combination mode or combi mode is you need more than one stitch at one time so go there and i am going to go to the alphabets and just pick one and put a b c i i never write a long word because if i need to test you know i need like a couple of letters that will do it a b c i always know what to expect so a couple of things when you do lettering it always has the the built-in lettering on your machine other than the monograms is always based on the left here the left the baseline will be on the left of your needle swing. So that's a good thing to remember. So when I, you, want to, you want to sew this, uh, a little tip number one with lettering, you go to your eye functions, you select all, and then it turns all blue. Then you say, uh, you probably want to sew this only once. So now you can set the repeat to only a single repeat. It will show up on screen here, and that will be one repeat, and it will stop sewing. I like that. So that, that kind of helps guarantee it. Next, I'm going to backtrack, long live the breadcrumb interface. I can backtrack to get all my other functions. So what I will do is, uh, you can scroll back to the beginning, the first letter here, you're at the beginning. And then before, this is before you sew, I'm still on the screen. When you select the securing function here, it activates, it shows on screen that tells you I'm, I'm about to secure, which means it will do it here at the beginning. And as soon as it secures like the three or four stitches, this function will unstick. It will release itself and go offline. So I, I'm going to use the little foot control at the bottom here. And I have my machine set to slow. You'll see that what happens when you do this. The needle stays on the spot here. See that? So it's securing. It, it's stitching right now. And then it will start moving forward. And I'm going to speed up a little bit. Go to my letters. And here's what I do. When I'm about to, when I know I'm entering the third letter, and typically I do this kind of work at mid speed, so I have time to react to things and I get the best stitch quality. So when it gets there, I'm going to stop. I've started on the C. I'm going to reactivate the, I just stop, you know, take my foot off the foot control, reactivate the securing function, and then resume stitching. And then because I have my pattern set to one repeat, there you go, it will stop at the end there. Now, when my son was little, I, you know, sometimes you do like name tags with lettering like this stitched out. My mother used to do this because if you do it with Sharpie and you wash a lot, it will wear off, right? So if you want to do this, you could program your lettering like I did. You want it set to just one repeat. That's good. But when it's time to secure, what you could do actually is you could actually uh, put a straight stitch, go to a straight stitch, make it very, very short. After you move it to the far left, make it very short and then you could actually stitch that out first and at the end that's the you know the hardcore way to do it if you want but the first securing function method i showed you works very well okay let's go back to face cam i'll read the next question okay question is a common question are the simulators available for the mac no, they are not. They are uh, compiled for Windows computers. I've, I do not have a, a Mac myself. I, you know what? I will go back and uh, basically see if I can run it with Bootcamp or Parallels on a Mac, on a Windows emulator. They are, uh, yeah, they are not available for the Mac, unfortunately. Um, okay, so now let me go back to my list of questions. Okay, so on the Q16, 
So we're talking uh, long arm, uh, typically on a sit down table or cabinet, uh, but they cannot be put on the on the Bernina uh, Studio quilt frame. Do I need to oil every day? If running the machine for about an hour a day, I don't want to over oil my machine. That's always a good uh, you know a good thing to keep on the back of your mind. So the answer I would say is yes. Uh, I do a smaller drop of oil and oil more often. It's like when you change the oil on your car you don't want the you don't want to go above the oil line right so you don't want to over oil the oil we use nowadays is a very very thin oil a velocite six it's called mobile velocite six velocite because it goes for mechanisms that turn really fast that oil especially if you run for an hour these machines tend to run at pretty high speed they warm up right it's a mechanism it warms up just like your car warms up when you start driving it and I don't mean just the engine, your transmission warms up, right? So in that case, that oil, if anything, will evaporate. Now, if you see like a wet, slick area around your bobbin case when you oil, there's plenty of oil left over there. I would actually probably take the bobbin case out and use a Q-tip or you know even a piece of cotton and wipe any excess oil off. But I found that a drop, a tiny drop every time works best for me because two things. It's usually not too much. And I never forget to do it. That you know, creating the habit is the way to go. So you're concerned about doing it every day. Uh, it can be alleviated, and it's a good plan to actually do it every day. Your second part of that question was needle threaders. Should you, should you use it if the needle is a size 70 or smaller? I have said in a previous webinar I've used my needle threaders on size 17 needle, but they're not recommended. The reason is that if your thread gets any thickness at all. Like we do a lot of quilting nowadays to show the, th the stitch. We want to show oftentimes the quilt stitch. If we're using a 40 weight, let's say isocord threads, great thread flows beautifully. The, you know, quilting machines love it, but it's thicker. So if you have a very small needle eye and you're putting a thicker thread, remember when the, the pusher, the little thing, little, the little prong that pushes the loop in. What it does, it, it has two strands of thread wrapped around it, basically on you know, top and bottom, and it's pushing that through the same needle eye. So if your thread gets thicker, that needle eye doesn't get bigger. So the, uh, the official recommendation is not to use a needle threader with a size 70 needle. If it's a super fine thread, it might be okay, but the risk is with thicker thread that you may bend a little prong. So at the, if you're using very fine needles like this, we tend to use 80 and 90s on our quilting needles, and then it's no issue. But I would say play safe. It's uh, it's definitely keep your needle threader the way it is. The reason the limitation is is that you need a prong of a certain size to work effectively, but the needle eye gets too small for that prong and the two li two lines of threads going through. So uh, it's really the needle that becomes the limiting factor here. Okay, next question. By the way, this feels a little funny because normally we spiel our thing, we present content, and then at the end we say, do, do you have any questions? And today I feel like I'm not presenting. <laughs> so it's, it's a different beat. It's fun though. Uh, and by the way, thank you for all of you who sent questions. We got a, a wide variety and a very good set of questions. So thank you for that. You made my job easier today. I did not have to you know, ask everybody, although I did ask my colleagues, what are the questions you get all the time? And the dual feed versus walking foot was one that came up because we do get that question all the time. All right. So uh, I have a Bernina 570 QE. Love, love that machine. Uh, so when you start stitching, oftentimes you uh, you get uh, you're doing a quarter inch seam, you get a stationary stitch at the beginning and it doesn't feed right away and it creates a knot and you don't like that. I will tell you. There's a function in your machine and you can turn it off. So let's go back to the screen. There you go. Show my screen. And let me show you how it works. Now it's the same on the 740, so I can do it here. So this is this is something on your 570. It has the same style of screen as this. If you have a seven series, eight series with the big screen, it's the same thing. You go to the gears, whether the control is on the right of your screen or at the bottom. You go to setup. It's a sewing setup. And then that little needle that secures here, that's the function. And if you forget what any of these settings are ever, because the thing with setup is that you tend to do it once, and then you forget where you did it because you know it was three months ago, six months ago. So if you forget anything, you can touch the question mark. 
you'll notice the highlight in blue, the, the, the glow on your screen, and it says, oh, you have a question? Touch what you have a question about, and it will tell you, tie off stitches. So these are actually stitches that tie at the beginning of sewing. So turn that off, and that whole thing is gone. I don't know why this is on by default. Um, I, I first thing I do when I update a machine or get a new machine, I turn that off myself. I like to secure when I want to. I don't want it by default. So you can turn that off. If you're doing a project where you're doing decorative stitches and you want to make sure that, or you're doing some construction and you want it to secure anyway at the beginning all the time, you can turn it back on. It's really up to you. It's your choice. But I turn mine off just about 99% of the time. Okay. So let's go back to uh, face cam. Okay, so, oh, good question. At times when I have to, I have to sew over very thick seams. So, you, you know, let's say jeans even, like you do cross seams, hems and like that. Two layers of denim, even the heavy, heavy denim, a size 80 jeans needle is just fine with that. But you get to that hemming portion and then you're gonna need a 90, and if it's a, a tote bag with, that was done in denim, you know, you're upcycling those jeans into a bag with the straps, you may need a size 100. So the way it works for me, how, basically how, the question is how thick uh, you know, a set of layers can I go over with my startup needle? And how do, should I select the right needle for the project? If it's gonna be side seam, like a tote bag, and you're just doing regular side seam, and it's gonna be regular bulk for most of it, I will switch needle in the middle of the project. I will start like like when I make jeans. I will start with a size 80. I don't make the holes any bigger than I have to. But when it's time to hem, or if it's time to put the belt loops or fix a belt loop that gets very thick, I will go to a size 90 or 100 to change to that. If you're doing a tote bag, and there's going to be like, you know, and when I do a tote bag, if it's going to be very sturdy, I have my straps, you know, the handles, I have the webbing go underneath all the way down and around the, the, the bag. That way, the, the straps are supporting the bag so the bottom seams don't have to. You can carry rocks in my tote bags. <laughs> they, don't, they will not rip. So if you're doing something that will have on and off heavy layers, I will select a big needle to start with. Here's the secret sauce. On a Bernina, and I, this is a Bernina hook, a four, five, seven series plate. Same with the eight series. Same with my old Bernina uh, 1260 with any of my Berninas. If I need to go over heavy duty stuff, I need one point. And I'm doing, let's say, jeans, heavy stuff. It could be upholstery fabrics. It could be heavy curtain fabric where you do like a bunch of seams and all that, right? Regardless, if, it is, if it's going to get chunky, I'm going to use foot 8 or 8D, right? There's two versions of the foot. There's no 8C because it's a straight stitch foot. Going back to the previous question, I will tell my machine, if I can, that I put 8D or 8 on. I use 8D because I have access to it because that will limit the needle to the center. I won't break needles anymore. I will put the straight stitch plate. And if you do this with a, if it gets heavy, like a tote bag, like if you know it's gonna get chunky on and off a lot during the project, I, you can, might get away with the size 90 jeans. I'm surprised, I've been surprised how well that does. Or a size 100. And then uh, if it's gonna get really chunky, like straps on the tote bag, I will go 100 top stitch. With that size of needle, a straight stitch plate and a foot eight or eight D and eight and eight D is available for every single Bernina. Like number eight fits on every Bernina and eight D if you have dual feet. Okay. So with those three foot eight of some flavor, straight stitch plate and a large, at least 90, but preferably a 100 jeans or top stitch, the, the foot and the plate are girding that needle as it goes down. So it doesn't bend, deflect and break. It won't break. So that allows you to go over everything. And actually, a lot of times, I don't even need to use the little leveling tool that we have, the three plates on a grommet that allow you to level the foot. I oftentimes, like for hemming jeans, I don't even need to use it. It's available if you need to, but most of the times it's not even necessary anymore with that combination. So that is, uh, if, it, if I know it's gonna get chunky on and off several times, I will just preemptively use the bigger needle. But if it's something I can assemble, like a jeans, a denim shirt, I will use an 80. And then if it's time for something chunkier, I might go to a 90 if need be. But uh, I, that depends on the project, okay? Aha, uh -huh. yes, exactly. So uh, good question. Where's the best needle for quilting the quilt sandwich? Okay, I piece, well, let's take a step back. We're gonna start with piecing. And 
I, I, I've nicknamed my colleague, uh, by my now retired colleague, uh, Nina McVeigh from Wisconsin, the Oracle of Wisconsin. She was our quilting expert, one of our quilting experts. And whenever I had a quilting question, I would go to her. For regular cotton piecing, you need a sharp needle. So I use a jeans needle, not because it's stronger, because it's sharp. They used to be called sharp. Then for a while, if you remember, those of you who have a bit of gray hair like me, remember that about 10, 15 years ago, they used, for a while, they were called jeans slash sharp. Then now they just call them jeans while well, they are sharp. So a jeans uh, 70 is big enough for regular piecing of cotton. I use a jeans 80 because I do embroidered quilts, so there's more layers in mine, but jeans 70 for piecing. For quilting, the quilt sandwich, uh, I use low loft batting. So uh, I use a quilting needle, or I use a Schmetz quilting needle for two reasons, because that's how the needle is designed. The quilting needle, remember I mentioned earlier today that there is a groove in the front of the shank that allows the thread to slide against the needle. When the needle does its thing, the thread is actually moving with a take-up lever a little differently. It needs to slide against the needle. The groove is deeper on a quilting needle, which means the thread can hide away from the little tendrils, the little tentacles, if you want, of the batting that could interfere with it and put friction on that thread, which means that the thread may leave a loopy stitch at the end, right? So with a deeper groove, the thread is sheltered from that and it slides up and down and it does a job. Also, the needle is slightly rounded at the very tippy tip tip. Not, it's not a ball point, but it's rounded, which means it's not going to damage, the, especially the bottom layer. When it goes through, it's not going to cut fibers into your sandwich, whether top of backing, and therefore it won't leave a little hole for batting to come out. So it helps prevent peekaboos. As long as you put your, your batting the right size, right? So the you know, right side up. And then you basically you're covered. So I use a and I will use I you typically use a 90. That way the hole, because it's slightly rounded and not cutting through, will close itself up and it makes for a very good passage, very good flow of thread. But I don't do that much stippling. I have colleagues who do stippling with a 70 needle. Uh, my colleague Marisa, who's an art quilter, she's been ex exhibited worldwide, right? She can do very, very she does filigree work almost with her stippling. I'm not that good. <laughs> So for that, you, she uses a tiny needle because she can, needs to be able to get very close and she will use a fine thread. So everything has to be proportional as usual, but a, a, a quilting needle is a very good starting point for your quilt sandwich quilting. And when I quilt in the hoop, I use a quilting needle because really it's not because it's in the hoop that it's not quilting anymore, right? So my needle is always selected by type first to match the project and the layers and the materials I'm working with, and then the size based on the on the you know the the bulk of materials I'm using, and then whether I'm doing the free motion myself, whether a free arm uh, long arm machine is doing it, or whether it's done in a computerized hoop, then it's still a quilt sandwich, right? And with the same thread, so I will I, I will use the the quilting needle for that. Okay, all right. Another question. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's okay. So we have what well, I assume is an eight series question. When doing decorative stitches, how should the bobbin be threaded? Uh, it depends on what you sew on. If you're sewing on delicate fabrics, you would want a stabilizer. Uh, I uh, the decorative stitches typically your machine, your computerized Bernina knows that it doesn't want to tighten those up too much. Typically, you'll notice that your needle thread tension on screen is a little lower than for a regular straight stitch. So that should take care of it there. But if you want, if you're doing something you know, with thicker thread, uh, triple stitching and all that, you could, uh, you could lower your upper tension a hair, maybe a quarter unit, or you could use for decorative stitches, you could use the yellow bar, well, on the eight series, you could crank your tension one notch. I typically have not needed to do this. Although, when you do decorative stitches, let's say you want to play with your, you know, your, your, leaf, your leaves and flowers and all the beautiful stitches, and you want to throw, make fabric with it, right? You just decorate fabric all over. You probably want to use a fine thread in the bobbin so you don't have to reload bobbins, right? If you do a finer thread in the bobbin, you can use the multi-purpose tool and then crank up your tension in the bobbin, just a hair, so that you compensate for a finer thread and keep that thread, that, that balance on your tension. Always test on a sample first. I like to use, uh, I like to use a stabilizer when I do decorative stitches. And one that I really like for this is OESD, Ultra Clean and Tear. It's called Ultra Clean and Tear. And it's a tear away. So when you're done, you can tear most of it off. 
it is not stiff it's not crunchy it's not too papery and if you need to tear the excess off it's soft it doesn't tug at your stitches too much and it leaves these very soft little residue beards if you want that will basically if you wash will disappear in the wash so it's very good for stitching and for after stitching for that uh, if i'm going to do something heavier let's say on a somewhat drapeable fabric i have to use fusible woven interfacing uh, oesd has one and or you have like shape flex uh, by pelon uh, you can you can put that on the back fuse it that will not deny the drape of your fabric but it will firm it up so that would also be a good one to try if your stitches are not too dense if the stitches get dense you need a kind of embroidery type stabilizer underneath and a little bit of temporary adhesive like 505 will help keep those together for best results okay so i have a question here that is uh can, how can you make longer length buttonholes for like a really large buttons or let's say for passing a strap through a piece of fabric right you need something the the automatic foot number 3a goes to like 29 millimeters finish size so 27 so basically an inch and an eight uh yeah an inch and an eight that's not long enough for a two inch strap right so for that let me see if i have it with me today uh, i have i brought a bucket of feet so i could fish uh, from there let me see if i can find one uh, i don't have all of them here i wish i wish i wish no not there so ah there it is so there is three versions of buttonhole feet basically there's a number three and number three c three c it is for nine millimeters wide and you can tell by the sole and it's a passive buttonhole foot you do your first bead you go backwards you do a second bead and you control it's going to be what we call a manual buttonhole that's your ticket and if i go to the uh let's go to my computer screen Uh, show my screen all right so if i pick a button hole here uh whoops let me see here oh, i didn't make comedy mode there you go let's go there there all right if i pick a button hole i would go to my eye functions and then i and this will answer another question we got so when you do button hole you know that with the automatic foot you can tell it the size and then measure the button on the screen or you know turn the knobs until the number here or the upper number matches the number on the button card that you bought okay so that's one for the automatic foot and i'll get right back to the manual one and then somebody asked what's this thing here the one two three this if you want to do a buttonhole let's say slightly longer than an, than an inch or maybe an inch and a half this is called a stitch counter it is it, what it will do is it will count the stitches going one way and then it will go back and try to do the same length the other way it's a pretty good on even fabrics like canvas plain cottons i would say well behaved wovens it, it would not work as well on a knit or something like that so a stitch counter is uh actually something you can use on longer ones but it's not it would not be my favorite so uh here let me um let me go back here All right so that would be for for recording there is the, the, what you can do also is uh, let me okay I'm, I need to clear my buttonhole because once you once you plug in a length it will be recorded automatically for you okay so the, when you do a manual buttonhole you basically I'm gonna go uh, I would not be here uh -huh. I w let me change simulator here I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to my uh, let's see here come on Oops, my laptop is playing funny simulators. Oh, I think it's the the webinar feed is making my uh, my computer. Yeah, I, it's like hiccuping. Yeah. All right, let me go back here. There you go. It, all right. So I'm gonna go to. Whoop, yeah, it's making my screen blink. So <laughs> I have to wait between my clicks. All right. So I'm going to select my foot. The simulator is not quite the machine yet. So I'm going to uh, go here, select the button hole. If you see this, it's because you came from embroidery. So I'm going to go here and select, in this case, foot number three. And I remember I said earlier, okay, this keeps blinking on me. 
I'm going to put 3C. All right, so I've selected my foot. And if your machine lets you select the foot, I do this every time. Now I still get a straight stitch because I need to, for the buttonholes, I will need to use a zigzag plate. All right, so when I select a buttonhole here, all right. So now when I go here, notice there is a, I, I, I used to joke, this is the man function. You have to tell it what to do every step of the way or you don't end up with what you want. So when I go here, if you have an old, I have an old Bernina 830 from the 70s. Remember the buttonhole knob that you turn one, two, three, four, five, six, right? This is it. You're back to completely manual. So circling back to the question about how do I get an extra long buttonhole? You use foot number three, no letters, or three C, which is what you know what which comes with the machines for that reason. And then you would basically, when that foot is on the machine, the machine knows it's not an automatic foot. So you'd be able to do the manual buttonhole and just go through the steps. So this will start at the back. It will do the bead forward. Then it will reverse back to the beginning. It will do the bar tack at the back. Then, and what happens is that you sew a segment. This will chain, the first two will chain on automatically. Then when you reach the, the top here, at the, at the end of the stroke, you know, the, the first bead, when it's long enough for you, you, you've marked that buttonhole, you've reached a second mark, you stop sewing, you, you take your foot off the gas, you will tap and let go of your quick reverse on the front of the machine, which is down here, right? So, and by the way, Bernina was the first brand with the 1130, 1986 to introduce the quick reverse right there where you sew, where you where the needle is. So you would tap that, the machine will go like, oh, oh okay, good, N need to switch mode. It will start traveling backwards with a straight stitch. Then when you reach the back, you stop yourself, then you tap, it will, it will keep telling you to tap the quick reverse. It will now do the bar tack, the bead forward. When you reach the, second, the front bead again, when you reach the end, you would tap again and then it will secure and you are done. So that's a manual buttonhole. You can go as long as you want. If a uh, little tip uh, from experience, if you do a longish buttonhole, like two, three, four inches, like to pass a strap, uh, you can do pillows that way. You could cord it. With, you know, with a fine cord, you could actually put the cord around the foot and cord your buttonhole. So since it's long, it will help track the length of the buttonhole and it will give you a nice sturdy buttonhole, especially if it's for like big buttons and something that will put a little bit of stress on the buttonhole. So that's four buttonholes. Yes. On the buttonhole? Okay, so on the buttonhole, if I press this function, so Judy's asking, how do I use the, the rec? Rec is for recording. You know, I wish that little dot was red because you know it's like that a little red recording dot on your camera. So if you, this is called, okay, when I go here, let me backtrack. If I go here and I select the length, it will require you me to use the automated buttonhole foot, the 3A, right? The automatic one. But if I use this, this is a stitch counter. This does not use the automatic foot. This uses the plane number three or three C foot. Then it will count the stitches and it, it will do a fairly good job of it. What I will do is I will start sewing and then when I, I, it will not stop. When I reach the length of buttonhole that I needed because I, you know, I, I marked it, right? I marked the, the start and the end point. So I will tap my quick reverse. And then it will have recorded the length by number of stitches. And as I said before, that, so then it will, re, it will reverse and it will go back and, and do the second bead the same way. That way I have a buttonhole. And it's repeatable because it recorded the number of stitches needed to make it that long. The potential issue there is that if your fabric has funky texture, think corduroy, the glide on the corduroy may not be 100% the same every time. So if you have, in a case like that, you probably want to put a stabilizer underneath. If you want to use, by the way, the stitch counter, which I almost never use, by the way, because I have the pre-measured within an inch and an eighth, and then otherwise I might do the manual buttonhole. But the stitch counter is the in-between. That's why they put the button there. It allows you to record a length, but by a number of stitches. So it relies and depends on the fabric feeding identically every single buttonhole. If you use a stabilizer underneath, like a lightweight tear away, or even a ultra clean and tear, that will help feed evenly every time. That way you can use the recorder 
and record a two inch long buttonhole and repeat it as many times as you want. If you want to make absolutely sure that those extra long buttonholes will be the same, you could just mark each one of them and then do the manual buttonhole every time. It's, it depends on your, on your project. If you're trying to do a buttonhole like this on something that's got a pile, a flush, or a funky texture, I would probably do them manually just because the fabric won't behave evenly every time and a recorded by stitch count buttonhole relies on an exact sheet the same time. It's just the physics of it, okay? You have a very good feed dog on your machine. It feeds very well, but if the fabric is squishy, like on polar fleece, polar fleece is squishy. It, whisk, it we may squish differently depending on how you handle the fabric. So in this case, a manual buttonhole would make sure that you go as far as you need to and uh, stop when you need to. And since I mentioned that, let me backtrack. Since I mentioned polar fleece, I just helped a friend put a buttonholes on a road that was very fluffy, plush material. It reminded me of polar fleece, kind of stretchy and fluffy at the same time. Number 53 is your buttonhole for squishy, spongy, fluffy fabrics. Those, those are technical terms. Think uh, sweat fleece, any kind of knit, polar fleece, uh, plush robes, you know, like something that with a lot of uh, fuzz on it. These are re that's a really the buttonhole. But we did use a stabilizer underneath. Okay, all right. So that's for buttonholes. Let me go back to my questions. No, no, I don't need this. Okay. All right. How how is back stepping different from? Continuous reverse. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna finger puppet that. <laughs> so uh, you're doing, let's say, a leaf and a vine. Okay. So you know, there's decorative stitches. They, they have a little straight line, like the vine, and then they do a little leaf, and then a little more vine, and a little leaf, and you can chain those up with flowers, and they look they look pretty, right? And the flower will have a little stitch in the middle, like a straight stitch that walks around a little bit, that walks forward, then does a flower, and then walks forward again. So you have a lead in and lead out, and these line up. So you can create a little, nice little garland if you want. Well, if you do, if you reach the end, you're doing decorative stitching, and you want to stop. You know, you hit a dead stop, like there's a cross seam coming up, or it's the end of the pocket topper, whatever it is, right? You need to stop right there. So in a straight stitch, that's easy. You press a quick reverse and it back stitches. You know, it will re it will reverse the it will stitch backwards. And because it's a Bernina, typically it will hit the same holes, but with a decorative stitch. Let's say you were doing the vine and the flower, and it alternates, you know, like leaf, flower, leaf, flower. You get to the dead stop, you're just about to finish the leaf, or, or may, let's say you just finished the leaf, and it's ready to start the flower. If you press quick reverse, you are continuing your stitch sequence, but you're going backwards. So now I would start doing the flower in reverse over the leaf right so it would continue the stitch sequence but in the wrong in, in this case in the other direction so it would oh it would basically stack two designs on top of each other not what we want back stepping is something you need to turn on it's not on by default but you can turn it on and uh when you turn it on like in the settings on your machine if you can do back stepping you can go to settings and then turn it on there but it will stick then you can turn it off again. And there's also on the eye functions on your machine, you can you can uh, turn on and off backstepping there. Backstepping, here's how it works. I have the same stitch sequence. I was combi mode, leaf vine with flower vine. So leaf flower, leaf flower, leaf flower, keep going. Hit my dead stop. I just finished the leaf, right? And I know that, you know, I, so I, I don't know what's coming next. In If I have the backstepping mode on, Instead of continuing in reverse with a flower and stacking and stamping a flower on top of my leaf, now what it will do is like think of walking in the snow. You know the first person that walks in the snow? Well, let's say you want to walk in the snow and there's like you don't want to make you want that's a joke, a prank that people pull. You know, you walk in the snow. I'm Canadian by birth, by the way. Uh, you walk in the snow and then you walk backwards in the same steps and it looks like you beamed up, like you disappear because the track ends there, right? So that's what would happen. You would do the leaf, hit the dead stop. When you you press the quick reverse button, that is now your back stepping button, then it will remember, well, that leaf in the vine, the last, you know, it remembers 200 stitches. You don't want to go that far back because tracking backwards with double down decorative stitches, it, it's not going to track perfectly for 200 stitches. And I'll explain that in a sec. So what it would do is when it hits the wall, 
when you say, oh, back step from here, it would say, oh, that was, okay, my last stitch was a straight stitch in the middle, okay, take that. The stitch before that was, you know, heading this way for the leaf, and it will backtrack in the same holes that were the holes approaching the point where you triggered the back step. So it will walk backwards in the snow in the same footprints. Now, why will it not go? It will go 200 stitches back, but here's why it's different. When you sewed forward, you were, let's say, on virgin fabric, and there's a, you know, the needle had to poke through that fabric. When the needle goes down, the fabric wants to cave in a little bit, the thread tugs at it, and then out the back of the foot, there's a tug that way. So when you, re you, when you reach the wall and you say, all right, do the end point, and you say, I'm gonna back step, the machine is feeding, the feed dog is doing the exact reverse motions. It's finding the same footprint, but the stresses, the pulls, the, the tensions, the tugs on that fabric are different. The, and the denser the design, the more different they are. So that's why triple stitches, you know, they do triple right away, but they keep moving forward. They don't do, you don't do a, a let's say, a triple zigzag by doing a zigzag and going back over the whole thing and then forward again. It does it on the fly because those stresses add up as you try to back step. So back stepping is really best used as a securing function, if you want, and a securing feature. And you really, you know, you might go like the first flower and stop there. You don't, you don't plan on going half a mile back because, again, what the, the material you're stitching on and the layers and the tensions, everything is different on the reverse direction than it was coming forward. Okay? So that's for backstepping. It's a nice feature, by the way. Okay. Uh, is it safe to use a needle threader on a size 70? or a smaller needle. 70 is borderline, the text recommend against it because if you, as I mentioned earlier in the, in the webinar, if your thread gets thicker, at first it may not go through and it may put too much, uh, too much pressure with the, the eye of the needle being so small that the prong may bend because the, 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 there's too much, too much sausage to stuff into that, that hole, the small needle. And if it's smaller than a 70, absolutely not. Then the prong will hit the eye of the needle. It's not, you know, the prong needs to be a certain size to be able to push thread. It cannot be, otherwise it would be a little tiny needle and it would poke through the thread, right? So it needs to be just a certain size to physically be able to push on that thread. And that minimum size, uh, you want to be size 75 and above needles to play safe. I have done it on 70s, but we don't recommend it because if your thread, like I support 40 weight thread, size 70 needle with a needle threader, you could bend the prong. Not worth it. Okay, then you basically use your snips, clean your thread, poke it through, or uh, yeah, poke it through. That that always that method always works. And by the way, that is why that little white paper is on the back of, on the front of your presser feet, so that it gives you contrast at the eye of the needle. Okay, uh, we have a, a question here. Let's see. Okay, the, uh, how do I reduce the size of the embroidery lettering, which comes in at about an inch plus? Uh, to fit, to put lettering in the small hoop, the very small hoop. You're going to have to test. This is when, when you have to test. You don't need to test with a small hoop. You can use, when I test, I will generate several samples and then maybe my large oval hoop, just run everything at once on a muslin. Some of the alphabets will shrink better than others. So you want to try different alphabets. And then uh, the recommendation lettering uh, is actually a little more tolerant to sizing, if you want a more uh, accommodating, than embroidery designs. Embroidery designs in the machines, we recommend plus 20 or minus 20% because the machine does not have the full uh, stitch engine like the embroidery software on the computer would have. So uh, the, the machine can do more than that, but you need to test always. There's two kinds of embroiderers, those who test and those who don't. And if you're gonna resize the design, it's, it's not a satisfaction. I've been doing embroidery since 1997, and to me, and I teach this, right? To me, it is still not a satisfying answer. It's one of those like, but mom, <laughs> it's a, but yes, but you don't like it. I don't like it, but it's the truth. So can't, can't, can't ignore it. You, you have to test. An embroidery design typically is designed, and alphabet is the same, a design to a certain size. So generally, if you downsize or up, upsize, you need to test. If you're a, a face and embroidery was yay big, the eyes are going to be two white, two black dots. If you blow it up to jumbo hoop, you're gonna have charcoal brickets for eyes. The eyes were not in there to start with, and vice versa. If you had a beautiful face, jumbo hoop, and you wanna fit it in a medium hoop, 
and you downsize it to that, something's going to go and it's not going to look pretty when you're done, right? So sizing, that's why there are sizing limitations. And in the machine, the recommendation is 20%. But lettering, I found, you know, grosso modo, I can go down to 50% and up to 200%. Some lettering in my machine, I've gone up to 400%. Up is easier and it's more likely to work. If you go down, check it out because there's a stabilizer, a stabilizing or basting stitch underneath. There's an underlay in some of the alphabets that may start showing if you go too small. That will be your telltale. The, yeah, of course, if you do a lot of lettering, uh, there's, there's two more avenues. You, if it's a monogram, like a one letter monogram, there are monograms on the sewing side of your machine. If your embroidery machine is a plus machine, like a 590, a 770 new QE plus, a 790 plus or an 880 plus, you can bring these sewing stitches when the side is on, uh, stitches on the sewing side of your machine. If you just leave it on the sewing side and then you go home and you switch to embroidery in your heart folder, your personal designs, it will be there. So if you did a little monogram and you wanted to stitch it out, you can actually transfer it over from sewing to embroidery if you have a full embroidery. That's the black heads or the plus machine, okay? So that is, uh, you'll have to test. There's no, no substitute for that. Uh, a little tip while using the small hoop, if you want to do the small hoop, for instance, is pretty tight, right? It's small. So if you want to do something small on, on a fabric that has a little thickness to it, like a fleece of any kind, uh, let's say sweat fleece, it's hard to hoop that fabric in there. I have been known to just float the project instead on a medium hoop with stabilizer, float it, not hoop the fabric, and then just use the basting box to stabilize that down. And then I could embroider it that way. So that's, if it gets too chunky for the small hoop, you can do the same thing in the medium hoop by floating the fabric, okay? Um, the hover feature on my 770 QE, can I turn that off? The answer is yes. Let's go to the simulator. Let's go to the computer screen. All right. So I was on the buttonhole menu here, but the, the hover feature is in the setting. So. It, it's in two places. This is in your manual. If you search for hover, and uh, I mentioned earlier, if you can download the simulator for your machine, please do so. And the uh, when you're on the support tab for the product page for your machine, look for the owner's manual. It's a PDF. I don't, I, the manual, the paper manual is beautiful, but I don't even know where mine is because I use the PDF version of the manual because I can search on that. So if you open the PDF and you say search, then you can say, search for hover, for instance, and it will give you the instances where it comes in. So that is something you use on the sewing side. And the hover is tied to the, the buttons, the needle down function in the button. So when you go there, there's a needle down function here. And he, this is where you select what kind of hover you're going to get. The default in the middle is hover about two millimeters on the um, on the uh, 7 and 8 series. Make a note, if you have a 570, a 590, a, a new 5 series, these machines uh, have a different way to measuring the foot height. So where the hover height, well, I'll show you where that's changed, you can change that height to something different. So th this is where you change the hover. Settings, sewing, the, uh, the uh, special action buttons, if you want, feature buttons, and then the needle down function. It only this only kicks in when the needle down function is active on your touch screen when you select a needle down on the top left of your screen. You can turn it off, no hover at all. You can have variable hover, like you select how high it will go, or you can have full height hover. Um, I've used this once when I was uh, we were uh, sewing little logo patches on uh, like tags on horse saddle pads. They're very squishy uh, pads. You know, think of something like a, a, a diaper changing table pad, but like 10 times thicker. So it was pretty thick, but squishy. So it was not a challenge for the machine. It's just that with the hover, when you would turn the corners on the patch, it needed to go higher. So I said, hey, go all the way up. So I've used this a couple of times. This is the default in the middle here, okay? So when that is done, there's another, uh, there's another function, which is the press a foot up and down. And this is how high you want the foot to go up when it hovers. So when you click on this or touch it on your machine, this is where you select the height of the hover. So there's two things is, do I want to hover? And how, how much of a hover do I want? So the default is two millimeters. That works well on a seven and eight series. On the five series, 570, 590, for instance, 
there is not a presser foot height sensor. It's a smaller head machine. There's not as many sensors in there. So the way that one works, you may want to go up to three millimeters. We found that that will accommodate various thickness of projects. And then your hover works perfectly for you every time. Uh, on the 7 and 8 series is a height sensor. So it's actually uh, the, the, the default will work very well for you. If you're working on a project that has, let's say, applique on thick materials and you want a higher hover, you could crank this up. So you can crank this up anytime and bring it back to default anytime. Nice and easy. So press a foot elevation. When you, This is when you push, uh, you just push the button to bring the foot down on your, let's say, uh, if, if, you know, on a 590, 7 and 8 series. When the foot comes down, it will hover back up to this height. And then, uh, so here's where you control the height. And then to turn on the hover or off the hover is with the needle down function here. Now, if you, uh, one, one time I do not use the hover is when I do applique. Because when, when the machine kicks the hover up, the foot up, if I want to start stitching, there's gonna be a delay because the machine will have to bring the foot back down before I can stitch. And if I'm approaching a corner, a place I need to pivot my fabric, for instance, then there's this two-step thing happening and that throws me. I grew up with a freehand system. So if I'm doing applique, I temporarily turn off my hover. That's personal, right? Preference. And I can use just the freehand system. The beauty of the freehand system is that it has a cable. Only Berlinas have this, by the way. Other brands of machine, the, when you do the freehand system, it's either all up or all down. We have a cable. So if you nudge the bar on with your knee a fraction, you get a fraction of a hover. If you go all the way with your leg, it will get all the way. And remember, your freehand system, if you find that it's a bit uncomfortable to use, uh, you know, if it leans against your leg or it's too far from your leg, the socket where the bar goes in is adjustable. Your technician at the store can adjust the angle of that socket. And so you could bring your machine, they can put it down at their sewing height, you sit down on a regular chair, and then they can, you can verify how, what they need to do to your socket. So it's adjustable. So you have it both ways. Typical Bonina, right? You can get any, a, a hover on demand any height you want with a freehand system, or you, if you do repetitive, like applique, the same thing, you want your hover, you can preset it the way you like it, and then it's predictable because you don't have to think about it, it will do the same thing every time. Regardless of which way you prefer, you have the option, and that's the best. Whichever option works for you is the best. Okay, so we're getting close on time, but I have a few more questions, so I wanna make sure I cover them because since you took the time today, I wanna to make use of that time. Uh, okay, what is the normal for the presser foot pressure? I have a 790 and a 590 and an 830. Wow, that's a nice sewing room. <laughs> so that's cool. So let me show you the presser foot pressure. On, the, on my 790, let me go there. I'm gonna to go, to go with a straight stitch. Okay. So all my 790 simulator, which is the same as the machine, you'll see that my default, uh, if I clear the stitch, my default uh, pressure foot uh, pressure, uh, sorry, that's tension. Pressure foot pressure is starts at 50. I believe on the five series, it's 70. It's because the, again, the head of the five series is, uh, let's go back to face cam. The head of the five series is different. So the springs in there are different. You know, the, the head is bigger on the seven and eight series. So the mechanism is bigger. And also these machines are taller. The take up lever has a longer stroke. The, the presser foot bar has a longer travel to get down to the fabric. So the mechanism is just different. So the numbers are different. Now, would I like that the, the, the engineers would have said, I don't care, I will just do the same scale on all the machines. That would have been my job easier, but in the end, if you press clear, you'll notice that your default is always the same. And the beauty of it is that if you, let's go back to the, the computer screen. If you change, if you change your presser foot pressure, if you change it here and you've cranked it up or down, by the way, if you do cr piecing, like cross, cross seaming on a quilt piecing, I learned that from my, uh, my colleague, Debbie Kachamani, I'll drop my, press a foot pressure by about half, which means when I go across those cross seams, they don't try to wiggle away from me. It reduces the push and the strain on them. So that's a little thing. But if you change it, you'll notice it turns yellow. That, that is your key. If you see the yellow here anywhere, that tells you you're not on the fault anymore. If you go back, you reopen the screen, right? You're, you're stitching, it's yellow, you go back here. Uh, if you change stitch, 
go back to like a, let me see i go whoops my screen is blinking if i go to let's say a zigzag notice that this is a, a, this is akin to a press of, this akin to a hardware a physical change it will stay yellow until you change it back so you would touch the setting again and then remember that if you have a touch screen bernina the uh, on all the current interface the numerical indicator that tells you what the setting is currently it becomes the reset button and that's it so that's uh that would be the default so it's 50 and i believe it's 70 on the five series but the results is the name it's is the same it's it's calibrating for the same results on your different machines so you don't have to worry about it just go with the individual machine okay and i believe i was on my last question no the last one Okay, let's let's go back to the simulator and then we'll we'll wrap it up. So, how do I know how many stitches are on my machine? Uh, two things before I answer. Number one, millions of stitches and it still doesn't matter. My 830 from nine from 2008 has over 12 million stitches on it and it still chugs like a happy camper. Uh, remember that if you do embroidery, especially uh, your uh, embroidery stitches are less stress on the machine because the needle is going straight up and down in the middle. There is no, it's not doing fancy zigzag and sideways motion, anything like that. So this is done through the settings. It's a machine thing, right? We want to know how many stitches in the machine. Oh, it's going to be an information piece. So it's the I. And then when you go to the, uh, the version here, it will tell you what your firmware version is. Very good place to go because the, especially the first number, first and second number here and the third, if you read this, you can go to the product information page on the website, Bernina.com. Let's say in this case, the 790, you go to the support tab, and then you'll see the firmware, the, the firmware number, the current firmware will be indicated at the bottom. I always get the new firmware, put it on. If you don't, if you have your machine serviced every year, like is recommended, your technician is tasked by Bernina to update your firmware automatically for you. And if you have saved personal information in your machine, your tweaked stitches, You've saved, changed default, changed your hover, all that good stuff. The way the firmware updates nowadays is that preemptively, at first, we'll save, archive all your personal settings, sewing and embroidery, to the USB stick used for updating. And then after doing the firmware update, we'll restore those settings back to your machine so you don't lose all the handiwork you've saved for yourself. Okay? So this is, uh, this is where, <laughs> this is a simulator, so it has not sewn much, but this is 206 stitches and number of stitches since the last maintenance, okay? And that, so it will actually uh, tell you that. Now, your, uh, your technician is able to see also how, long, how many hours the machine was left on. It does not matter. And actually, it was not asked, but there's a, a question we get often is, how long can I leave my machine in echo mode? Uh, most people are afraid of leaving in the echo mode. First thing, make sure your machine is on a good quality search suppressor a surge protector if a surge protector has been challenged by uh, like lightning storms you know that it's been zapped a couple of times you know it's been and it still works you know it still lets uh, power through if your search uh, let's go back to face cam if your surge suppressor you know it's been challenged like you left on vacation and somebody your neighbors tell oh you should have seen the lightning storm we had be careful it may have been if it gets challenged too many times it may lose some of its uh, ability to suppress surges. Uh, surges are uh, in a way more suppressible than brownouts. And brownouts are rare where I live, but when I used to live in Ithaca, New York, when I went to, I was a grad student at Cornell, we got brownouts all the time. And not enough to kill the power, but to lower it. I've measured 100 and, uh, 108 volts, 105 volts. It would just dip. Computers don't like, of any kind, don't like those. So I use a UPS at home, uninterruptible power supply. Uh, you go to you know the Best Buy, the, the the office supply store, Staples, any place like that. Uh, I know the big brands like Belkin make one. Is a battery inside, so not only it's a surge suppressor, but it has battery backup. So those where I live, we specialize in 0 0.3 second power outages. I think it, they must be switching equipment because my microwave will blink. <laughs> That's all that happens. My my stove won't, <laughs> but just enough to blink the microwave. So with those. The, the UPS, as we call them, will basically kick in and prevent the voltage from dropping. That way, I don't lose my work. If I'm running embroidery, it will finish the color even. That, so that gives you backup. Back to echo mode. Echo mode saves all the tweaks you've done today. You change your zigzag, you move a needle position on the stitch, 
you did uh, you change a pre uh, uh, you know attention on the stitch because you were using a thicker thread. You did 50 tweaks today. You were having fun. You you tweak stitches and you stitch them out. If you turn the machine off, you lose all of that. Right? It's temporary altered stitch memory. We call it. So it's a there's a temporary memory that does all of that for you. You don't need to turn it on. It doesn't. But it goes offline when you turn it off. So you put the machine in echo mode. You come back tomorrow and you that stitch you did that blanket stitch is still on the far right with the stitch length and width you selected with the tension and all that. Love that feature. You can leave the machine in echo mode for days then. I left on vacation this uh, September. I had not seen my mother in Canada for, and she's 89 years old, right? Two years, I was really raring to go. So I'd used my 790, my work machine, uh, the week before, like on the Wednesday, and I left on, uh, I think, Saturday. And I forgot it was in echo mode, I left it on. I came back three weeks later, and I did not need the machine right away. So midweek again, four full weeks later, my machine was still in echo mode. And I said, oh, there it is, because the lights turned off, right? So it's hard to tell. So I, I woke it up and it just beeped, you know, it burped. It did its calibration and it said, I'm back. What do you want to do? Everything that I had on screen, it was still there when I came back. So we don't recommend leaving a machine on if you're not using it. Uh, and that was a mistake, but you can, uh, there's no bug, right? You can leave it on if you say, you know what? I don't have time tomorrow, but I still want this stuff on my machine when I come back in two days. By all means, you can leave it in echo mode and make sure you're in a good surge suppressor. And the reason I use a UPS is that if the power went off, my echo mode is still there. My, my altered stitch memory is still there because the machine would not go down completely. So that's why I use it. But yeah, echo mode can be left for extended periods more than just overnight. Okay, so that's it for questions. Thank you for joining us today. This, uh, we have an, an afternoon session again this, you know, at 3 p.m. today. So if you know somebody who missed it this morning, they can catch it. And we will have one of the two recordings available for uh, watch out later. So it'll be put on the recorded webinars in the learn and create section on Bernina.com. So thank you for joining us. And until next time, happy sewing.